Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Oh. Oh, yeah, to live and die in San Francisco, welcome to The Savage Nation. I am not a guest-driven show. I'm generally um, about me or what I see the world as, callers. Today I have a guest. I turned on the Drudge Report this morning as usual after a fitful sleep. I had to take a Benadryl last night, which I use very, very rarely because of the Chinese food. I don't know what they're putting in the food. My skin was on fire all night. I said no salt and pepper. They snuck in white pepper. I was on fire. I had to take a Benadryl. So I wake up open the Drudge Report to get my mind off petty complaints. And I see this story, Netflix producer unloads on Sean Penn. Own actions to blame if killed. Sean Penn put everyone in dangerous situations. And I love documentaries, so I clicked on it. And it's the day I met El Chapo, producer detailed Sean Penn battle exclusive. Producer David Broom on his Netflix documentaries, Behind the Scenes Struggle. Sean was concerned he was going to look like a jerk, but I didn't care about his Hollywood clout. So I read the article, and I try to book the uh, producer on, and he's on the show at the bottom of this hour, at 34 minutes after the hour. That would be David Broom. I've never met the gentleman, but we will meet him together. And the claim comes after Penn tried to block this three-part Netflix documentary series, according to this article. It says... uh, Penn tried to derail his new de- Netflix documentary, The Day I Met El Chapo. Now, this critically acclaimed series released was released on Friday of last week, and it chronicles Mexican telenovela, telenovela star Kate Del Castillo uh, and Sean Penn's infamous 2015 meeting with cartel kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. And they say, now I'm quoting now, an event which may or may not have helped lead to Guzman's eventual capture, close quote. And in this article, the producer, Mr. Broom, David, gives his his first full interview detailing how the project came together, his attempts to get Sean Penn on board, uh, and claims that the documentary is putting the Oscar winner's life at risk. I thought this would make for very interesting radio, and he will be with us at the bottom of the hour. Also today, a package arrived at my front gate, I didn't know what it was. I opened it as the first copy of God, Faith, and Reason, which I'm not going to read from until you can actually go buy one in a bookstore because it will be futile for me to... If I go off too early on this book, it will be um, a preemptive strike. that w- it, it will slow down your desire to go into a bookstore and buy God, Faith, and Reason. And speaking of that, by the way, if you want to see the cover and me holding it with my Savage Nation hat taken 30 minutes ago right here in my home studio... It's on Facebook or um, my, my, my Twitter feed. Actually, it should be up on my website if you're paying attention. Put it up on the website too, michaelsavage.com. I have a few things I have to say. I, I, I also saw this morning that the word God is in a lot of articles all of a sudden. O'Reilly said he's mad at God for what happened to him. What, what he got $20 million? That wasn't enough? Was he mad the payment was too small? I didn't understand that one, but he used the word God. And then a really great actor from Hollywood, whose name I forget. What's his name? Who said that Mark Wahlberg hopes that God forgives him for him playing a porno star in a movie 30 years ago, 20 years ago. So I said, why is God suddenly everywhere I turn, the word God? And the answer is simple. I've been on the air almost a quarter of a century. Even though I am the unknown talk show host, I have a huge following And everyone knows who I am. Everyone listens to the show that I know of. I hear people on the inside tell me everyone they know listens to it. Everyone in the power structure listens from time to time. You would expect that with a national show that's been on the air almost a quarter of a century, even though I'm never seen anywhere or heard only on this radio show. So the word they know that I'm publishing God, Faith, and Reason. They know which way the wind blows, and they know God is in the air. And so suddenly it's now safe to quote the word God, which is interesting. So I've already done my job. And now I can retire. Thank you very much for listening. 
I'm retiring today. No, but I mean, I could. Today could be the day. I've done my job. I'm the salmon who swam upstream. I have uh, fertilized the eggs, and now I shall roll over in the cool, shallow waters. Not. So what would you like to talk about? There's so many stories that got my attention. I, I almost don't know where to go because I know once I get started on some of these, we're not going to be able to get back very easily to the guest who's coming up at the bottom of the hour. So one of the stories that caught my eye was something I predicted might happen. A professor is now claiming that math, algebra, and geometry promote white privilege. I said, no, this is not made up. It can't be. The Daily Caller, Ian Mills Chung, wrote that a so-called University of Illinois math professor has said that algebra and geometry perpetuate white privilege because Greek terms give Caucasians unearned credit for the subject. She also believes that any evaluations, meaning tests for math proficiency, perpetuates discrimination against minority students if they do worse than their white counterparts. Now, how this moron, Rochelle Gutierrez, could ever become a math teacher in this day and age is not beyond me. This is what's happened to the universities. Here is a woman who teaches math. She put out a newly published math education book where she argues, again, that algebra, geometry, and math themselves prom promote white privilege. But it gets even worse. She argues that reason itself promotes white privilege. And the only way to understand anything is subjectively. She said that only subjective understanding can eliminate white privilege. This lunatic says that minorities have experienced microaggressions from participating in math classrooms where people are judged by whether they can reason abstractly, and I'm not, I have to quote, end the quote there. To resolve the intelligence gap, Gutierrez calls on math professors to develop a sense of political conocimiento, a Spanish term for political knowledge for teaching. This idiot concludes her argument with the claim that all knowledge is relational or relative. And listen to what this psychotic says. Things cannot be known objectively. They must be known subjectively. Let me explain something to you. If people like this had been teaching in the 1930s, you'd be speaking German or you'd be a lampshade. Let me say it again if you don't understand the drift of what I'm saying. If idiots like this had been teaching in America in the 1930s, and our children in the 1930s had not been taught to reason, to do mathematics, they wouldn't have been able to build a bridge, they wouldn't have been able to build a plane, a tank, they wouldn't have been able to reason, and we would have been defeated by Hitler, and you would be speaking German or you'd be a lampshade. I'll repeat it enough times for you to understand how dangerous this country has become as a result of the totalitarianism of the left or the tyranny of the minority. And affirmative action has destroyed reason itself. I warned you years ago that one day we may wake up and find out that the words white Christmas would be offensive. Remember years ago I did this show? I said white clouds would be the word white clouds would be offensive. I said that reason itself would be attacked as white privilege. This must end, and the only way to end this is to laugh these people out of the classroom. You must teach your children to laugh at these professors, to video these professors, to circulate the psychosis of these professors and the overt racism of these professors before this nation devolves into a psychic cesspool. Other than that, I have nothing to say on the matter. The phone number here is 855-407-282. If you want to read the article, it's linked up on my website, michaelsavage.com. Where is this going to end? White privilege is when you can reason? White privilege is when you can be objective in your knowledge? All of science is built on objectivity. The reason that there is so much controversy about the false claims of climate change is because they become subjective in their opinions rather than objective. An objective discussion of so-called climate change would show the other side of the coin, the other side of the argument, wouldn't it? That's how science operates. 
So if you let these psychos take over all of science, which they have already done with regard to climate science, eventually reason itself, which is now under attack, will disappear. Which leads us back to my book, God, Faith, and Reason. You see, everything's going to lead me back to that. I, I saw this coming. I sensed that the world of, of the mind was devolving under the left. I felt that the radical leftists who could not hold an argument or win an argument when actually challenged would devolve to hatred, would resolve, revol revolve to violence, and devolve ultimately to insanity. And that's what we're living through right now. So I wrote a book called God, Faith, and Reason, trying to show you out there that you can be faithful and reasonable at the same time. And listen to the third word in that title, God, Faith, and Reason. Reason is a form of thinking that was developed by the ancient Greeks. If you read Aristotle or you read Plato, you'll understand the basis for all. Reason was built upon Greek knowledge. And I studied once when I was very young. I don't know. It was at City College of New York, I believe. I went back to graduate school when I thought I was not thinking clearly. I remember very distinctly why I took this course in uh, reason and scientific method. And we actually translated Aristotle into mathematical formulae. And we had to use mathematics to read Plato. That's when, when the courses were actually taught as such. Today, I don't think they could teach science, logic and scientific method at City College in New York. It would have to be filled with some kind of hatred and screeds against society, Trump, and, uh, and the American way. But I studied logic and scientific method, and I learned that his mind was so great, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greeks' mind, Greek minds were so great, the philosophers who gave us the basis of Western civilization, that you could reduce their words to mathematical formulae and see how perfectly they were ordered. They lived and tried to create an orderly world. I remember when I was in high school, I read Plato's Republic, and I was so impressed by it, I kept my copy of the book. I remember the Modern Library edition. I wish I still had that edition. I put it somewhere, it'd be great in my archives. It's marked all over the place like a Bible. But I named this show The Savage Nation when I first started the radio in 1994 based upon the name Plato's Republic. A program director who I've not kept in touch with said to me, what do you want to call your show? I said, I don't know. She said, well, what do you like to read the most? She said, you always talk about Plato's Republic. She said, why don't you call it The Savage Nation? I said, okay, great, thank you. This is a show where logic reigns. Logic itself is now under attack by people who are illogical and insane. They cannot keep up. They're not equipped to keep up. They have no reason. They cannot do mathematics, and yet they're mathematics teachers. That would be like hiring a person who can't fly to be a jet pilot, which is what Obama did. He took a woman who never flew an airplane and made her the secretary of the Air Force. That would be like taking a woman who never steered a 40-foot boat in open seas and making him the secretary of the Navy. That's what Obama did. He destroyed Western civilization one brick at a time. And now you understand why Trump is attacked on a daily basis. You know why? Because he's trying to rebuild America brick by brick. As flawed as he is, as imperfect as he is, as brusque as he is, he's trying to put this nation back together again. And all of the Humpty Dumpties who broke it down don't want this nation to be built back together again. This is Michael Savage, home of God, faith, and reason. Bottom of the hour, the producer of the El Chapo documentary to tell us what really went on in Mexico. It's a very, very, very interesting story to me. I hope it is with you. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. so-called professor has now claimed that math, algebra, and geometry promote white privilege. 
And she goes even further, this this person, and she says that um, all knowledge is relative, that things cannot be known objectively. They must be known subjectively, which means if it feels good, do it. Now, you understand that the entire basis of Western civilization is built upon objectivity and reason, which is why the tribalists, the primitivists who cannot reason, are trying to destroy the pillars of civilization, which is thought itself. You understand that? Where does it end? I know where this ends, unless we stand up to them, which I do every day. Where does it end? Michael on WABC, where does this end? I'll tell you where it ends. It's going to end in a second Holocaust against white people. Well, I don't agree it's going to end that way. I would agree with you that these psychopathic racists would like it to end that way. We're taking very, very little steps towards that, but I believe that that is eventually where this is going to really end. That's going to be the end of it. Yeah, but you're assuming that the white people are going to st- are going to just roll over for these psychopaths. No, no, no. They'll try to fight back, but I, I think that they'll, I think that they will be overpowered. Well, you have a very dim view of the future. I, I don't see it that way. Brock on WABC in New York, you want to comment on this psychopath? Go ahead, please. Hi, um, I'd like to first say uh, I'd like to give a shout-out to all our troops protecting us home and abroad. Um, second, I guess my my comment is really about, um, like, how do you see it? I mean, where do, where do these uh, concepts of um, white privilege and, um, you know, upper crust, like, where do they, where do they start and, and, like, how do they keep being reciprocated? I mean, unless you have something that is in... in um, if there's something that is trying to convince people that this is where we started, you know, this is how things began. I mean, if you only start with the Greeks, as if the Greeks started everything, that's that's a little... Uh... Well, you if you don't understand the basis of Western thought, I can't help you. If you don't understand the basis of Western civilization, I can't help you. Unless you have some knowledge of the world in which you live, there's nowhere to begin. That's what I'm trying to educate you. Yes, it's all built upon Greek civilization. That is correct. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Back to the Savage Nation. In a few moments, we're going to speak with uh, David Broom, executive producer of The Day I Met El Chapo, the Kate Del Castillo story. I just want to, you know, get started in the right way here. I've always been fascinated by crime. I've been fascinated by criminal kingpins ever since I've been a child. And the more I studied crime and criminals, uh, the more I realize that the great leaders of the world are not too far apart from the great criminals of the world. They're just smarter. And while criminals have uh, armies of gangs, uh, leaders have have armies. In other words, a criminal leader will have an army of hitmen. A president will have a military. In that sense, they're one and the same. And then when my mind took me back to biblical days and I read about King David, and I realized that King David became the king of all Israel by killing all the other tribal leaders, I said, you know what, King David was in many ways like a narco-terrorist of his day without the drugs. The ruthlessness, the bloodthirstiness, the quest for power. So when I saw that Netflix had a show coming up on El Chapo, I said, wow. And then I'm reading all of this stuff going on that was just coming out today on this story. And I said, I I hope we can get David Broom, the veteran TV producer, who was being attacked viciously by... Sean Penn, who was trying to stop his Netflix Netflix documentary The Day I Met El Chapo. So uh, that's the background, and now the foreground, David Broom, producer. Welcome, and thank you for being with us on The Savage Nation. Great to be here with you, Michael. So, David, how is the series playing on Netflix? It started on Friday. 
Are you getting a lot of viewers? Yeah, you know, the, the, the beauty and the frustrating part of uh, Netflix as a producer is uh, you don't know the numbers. We don't live in that numbers world anymore with Netflix. But the oh. that we know uh, with our relationships there that it is registering, that people are really, really um, finding it, and, um, and the response has been overwhelming, and I'm thrilled for that. So where does your documentary go that has not been gone before? Where do you go with it? Though? In what direction do you go with this documentary? Well, you know, when I first met, I was introduced to Kate, to Kate Del Castillo, in, uh, in September of 2016. And I had only heard about the top line of this crazy story. I mean, it is a mouth-dropping story, uh, stranger than, you know, uh, it is truly life-imitating art. And I, I said, uh, you know, I, boy, I never expected to, her story to lead to so many other areas that, um, that we kind of get into in a very deep way in this documentary. We talk about, you know, you're so right, um, just listening to your setup about government and leaders and, and cartels, and there's a gray area here. And we talk about it in Mexico um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that I never expected. So I think what the audience is finding is, yes, you know, come for the um, El Chapo, come for the wild story, the incredible Sean Penn, Kate Del Castillo journey deep into the Mexican jungle. But you're also going to stay for the story about corruption, sexism, you know, the machismo attitude, you know, the history of all this. You know, how did this all come about? And I think... But, I want, but David, listen, this is a very dangerous subject you're talking about here. When you consider there are armies of dead people with their heads cut off, you, you've done a documentary here as producer. I mean, are you in any, you know, any risk here? No, I, I don't feel like uh, I am. I, I think we've dealt with the subject... Um, in a you know in a in a truthful way, I think we've dealt with it in a very respectful way. When when you think that we're not trying to be exploitive, we're not looking to uh, you know be gossipy. We're trying to be um, uh, you know opinionated, and at the same time you know get the story that needs to get out. You yourself have done an amazing job over your career for freedom of speech and getting stories out that sometimes are tough and this is one of them yeah it is well so that's what i'm asking el chapo guzman is now in an american where is he in 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 the in, in florence city i'm sorry which prison is he in in a jail but where um i don't know you know I'm not sure um, exactly because there's been a couple of different reports as to where he is, and that stuff is a, a bit uh, secretive. So we know that he is awaiting trial. The trial is supposed to take place in early 2018, first quarter, somewhere around there. And, um, and so, you know, he's dealing with uh, his legal issues right now. All right, so the day I met El Chapo, the Kate Del Castillo story, is this about her, or is it about him, or is it about you? It's not about me at all. Um, it is definitely Kate's story. So, you know, Kate started as this telenovela actress, grew up um, in a, a well-known family in Mexico, and grew up into that system. And, you know, what ended up happening is in 2012, she sends out this tweet, uh, a, a long letter tweet, basically denouncing the Mexican government and her opinion as to the bad things that are happening to the people of Mexico, and in a way propping up El Chapo, saying, you know, you can take your power, you can do a better job with your um, power than our own government can. Wait, so she's saying he's like a Robin Hood, even though he killed so many people? Well, you, you know what, Michael, I'll tell you something. She's not saying it necessarily in that in that statement, but you hit on something that is actually, uh, you know, in the culture. There are, uh, well before um, El Chapo, there's a long history of drug leaders, cartel, uh, the cartels themselves, um, playing that Robin Hood role. 
Um, you know, I'll... I I have to interject, David. This is such an interesting conversation for me. When I was in L.A. about a month ago, I was watching. I don't know whose documentary it was about narco terrorism. It was in Spanish with English subtitles. I'm sure you must have watched it while making this one, and it showed the the music, the music that was being produced. That they'd hired their own songwriters and singers to glorify their their activities. Uh, um, what is that called when they sing their songs? Uh, uh, they're. they're um, uh... It'll come to me in a second, but that is exactly. I know the documentary. Um, it was beautifully shot. Um, it is part of the culture, and and they'll, in that documentary, they went out and were showing some of the concerts. And you're not only you seeing those the, the those musicians playing that, but you're seeing the entire audience that's there singing these. Yes. Hard. Yeah, I, I I went. I was watching this documentary about a subculture here in the United States of America, amongst Mexican American young people who go to concerts where the stars, the rock stars, are going around singing the praises of narco terrorists, and they're dancing and singing along because they are their Robin Hoods and their heroes. That's right, and I'll, let me tell you something, Michael. In this documentary, in the in the in the day I met El Chapo, we we you'll see some of that here. You, not necessarily some of the singing, but you'll hear comments from the people of Mexico who are who prop up um, El Chapo um, for doing better than and helping them out more than their own government is. And this is where the the but how does it help them out? Let's be come on, let's be real here. The people are, people are killed who stand in their way, including innocents. There's a, there's a part in the other documentary about, um, I think it was Juarez. What is the American city, El Paso, direct across from Juarez? Sinaloa. Yeah, no, but there was an American city on one side of, El, of the border, El Paso. On the other, I believe, was Juarez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Juarez was once a thriving Mexican city, and according to that documentary, the cartels threatened all of the businessmen, extorted all the businessmen, and the city of Juarez became a ghost town. The children hide in their houses. They're afraid to go out because of the murders that are occurring. So, I mean, we have to be a little yeah. cautious in how we glorify, how we glorify uh, a wanton murder like this. But some, some of those same people will tell you that that's a, a similar treatment as they're getting from their own government. So that there is... That that's where it becomes a, a, a very interesting topic, where you're where they're telling you that you know they're they're getting the, treated the same way from their own government as they are from the cartel leaders. And by the way, the cartel leaders are probably in some cases doing a better job to help them out. And how they the, how do they help them? But David, how do they help them out? Well, they, I mean, it's known that. That um, that uh, they um, build infrastructures in these communities. They help give out food. They give out clothing. You know, they they, they spread their money. That's this. That's yeah, but that, that's that's like Al Capone giving out turkeys at Thanksgiving. You know, I mean, most of the money does, most of the money doesn't go to the people. But let's focus on your documentary on Netflix because I think that's more interesting to my audience, David. Uh, the lady, the woman, the brave, brave reporter. She's probably one of the bravest, bravest journalists in the world right now, isn't she? Yeah, you know, I think, and and I think one of the one of the really um, proud things that I'm seeing is that kind of a response. You know, it, it's a very interesting time for us right now, in a fortuitous way, on a tragic situation that you're seeing about in Hollywood and around the other industries as well. In the Harvey Weinstein, you know, women are speaking up. Kate was a, is a is a was somebody who spoke up early in her career. She left a system there. She is very brave, and it's being recognized. And I'm and I'm glad for that because that's a big part of the story. All right, now let's bring up the four hundred pound gorilla, Sean Penn. How do you handle that here? I mean, he didn't want this documentary to be made, correct? Yeah, he didn't. You know, I knew it. You know, he. The, the story, as, you, as some of your listeners may know, is that uh, Kate went down. She, she sent this tweet out. El Chapo responded a couple of years later, about a year and a half later, and lo and behold, she has given the life rights to El Chapo. She is introduced to Sean Penn. They're supposed to go down to Mexico to meet El Chapo and firm everything up, which is a crazy escapade, and I'd even love to ask you if you were given that chance. Let me just stop for one second. If you were given the chance right now to go and meet with El Chapo in the middle of the jungle as a guy who you know who escaped, would you do it as a journalist? 
Well, first of all, I'm not a journalist. I'm only a talk show host, so I'm I'm not in that regard okay. trying to find the talk show. But you're, you're well. You're asking me, would I meet with him? I would, I would. But what story would it be that I'm trying to find out about? You know, I mean, of course I would, because frankly, I think I think that here's the thing I understand. If he were to agree with someone like myself to meet with me, what would he be meeting with me for? He wanted to hurt me, could hurt me without my going there. So it'd be he wants to get some story out. So in that sense, you have a protection. Because he wants his story told, am I right? That's what motivated you to do it without fear of being whacked. He he wanted his story told, and I, and 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 he gave those rights to Kate to do it. Kate uh, brought Sean Penn into the project after Sean expressed interest, and what Sean what they thought they were going down, or Kate thought she was going down there for, was a meeting deep in the jungle with El Chapo to get everyone to feel comfortable. What ended up right. was Sean, according to Kate dropped the bomb in the middle of that meeting and that was that he had prearranged an interview with Rolling Stone magazine to to do something with El Chapo. Kate claims that she never knew that was coming and there's a big Oh, oh, oh so he wanted to do his own interview around right. your around her interview. That's right. She was they were just going there to get to talk to him and make everyone feel comfortable so they can say, Okay, look, we're gonna come back and do the movie. What Kate has said, and this is a story that, you know, is featured in, in this documentary, is Kate said, look, I never knew that he, that, they were, that he was doing anything with Rolling Stone. He brought it up in, in, the, in the middle of a meeting, which was... Okay, look, I'm speaking with a, with a very important... Can you stay with us, David? This is a very important interview to me. I hope my listeners are following this. Uh, there's a huge point of contention in this whole subject here, which is that Penn is afraid that he's going to be harmed because he feels that he is afraid that they think he alerted the Department of Justice as to where he was traveling to the secret location in Mexico to interview El Chapo. Now, Penn has strongly denied this through his lawyer, uh, and you are now caught in the middle of all of this. And, and when I come back with David Broom, who is the producer, the executive producer of this very, very important documentary on Netflix, the day I met El Chapo, the Kate Del Castillo story, I would like to ask you, David, where do you think this will end with regard to that fear? I'll be right back on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. I have very little time left in this hour with producer David Broom on his Netflix documentary, The Day I Met El Chapo, and we haven't gotten into the Sean Penn battle, but I highly recommend that you review the Netflix documentary. David has to leave us. David, welcome back. Any last thoughts? David Broom, line 10. Is he still with us? I see the line is I'm here. Dead. I'm here, Michael. I David, really are there any, any last thoughts on this particular situation that you'd like to share with my audience? Well, look, I, I, I encourage everyone to watch it. I think there's some um, some incredible messaging. She's an inspirational character, um, uh, Kate, in this. I think it's hitting on lots and lots of um, things that are very relevant um, that's going on in just so many different areas of our society today. So, uh, you know, please check it out. So Sean Penn was not able to stop the documentary in plain English? Well, yeah, he, he was not able to stop it. I think, you know, he was looking to have it changed. I asked him to participate in this. We went to him several times. Um, you know, we never got a response from him. And even though it's Kate's story, I wanted to hear from him. Um, and when we did hear from him, we were uh, just um, uh, very close to our release date. We couldn't have made any changes, nor would we want to have made any changes. But, David, so, uh, Penn is say Sean Penn is saying that this documentary could put his life at risk. He is quoted as saying, blood will be on their hands if this film causes bodily harm, unquote. Do you think this concern is valid? I do not think this concern is valid. This documentary, there is nothing in this documentary that is going to cause Sean Penn or anyone else um, to be in any harm's way. If, if, if he were in any harm's way, and I'm not sure he is at all, um, it, it would only be because of his own actions, nothing that's coming from this documentary. Yeah, well, we can leave it at that because this is a very, very sensitive topic, obviously, and 
We don't want to cross lines. I, I res- respect that, no, David. I don't want anything. We, we never want. It's a, we, we, we have thought about this long and hard, both, you know, not just from a legal standpoint, but a moral and ethical standpoint. And David, I want to say to you, thanks for being with us. I know you have to run along, and I'm sure we'll speak privately about something that's of extreme interest to me that may be of interest to you. And uh, David Broom, Netflix, The Day I Met El Chapo, I highly recommend it. Watch it. This is the Savage Nation. When I come back, all the news, views, and reviews that you have come to expect from the show where God, faith, and reason prevails. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Better not go highbrow in this hour because the audience doesn't want to go highbrow. They want to go midbrow. Let's say midbrow. So in the last hour, I have to review it. I was saying, why do you think all of a sudden we're seeing the word God everywhere? Wahlberg, O'Reilly, all of a sudden they're mentioning God. Then I told you the first copy of my book, God, Faith, and Reason, arrived about an hour before the show, and I asked you to pre-order it for a faithless friend. It's mainly aimed for those who have dropped out and somehow remember that there may be something more than themselves motivating them and also that's in charge of it all or something like that. God, faith, and reason. We'll get into it when the book is actually available for you to purchase, which is November 14th. And then we went to an interview. Oh, no, no. Then after that, I told you the story of a so-called professor at the University of Illinois, which used to be a great university before affirmative action destroyed it. A so, I could see if it was a professor of, let's say, ethnic studies who did this, or a professor of uh, I, I don't, basket weaving. But this person is a math professor who has the nerve to say that algebra and geometry perpetuate white privilege. And she goes further, this nutcase. She says math professors must learn to teach that all knowledge is relative, that things cannot be known objectively. They must be known subjectively, which, of course, is utter rubbish. And I can prove it in one paragraph. Are you ready for this? Curse me if you want, and curse all males, all white males if you want, or curse all males if you want, but that will change nothing about reality. Would we have atomic physics and electricity if it hadn't been for the ancient Greek philosophers who, for example, had the idea that all matter consists of ti- tiny atoms, Did you know that in the 5th century B.C., Aristotle used electric charges to treat gout because he understood what electric charges were? Did you know that Archimedes perceived the center of gravity of solid cylinders and spheres? Now, these basic discoveries of Greek civilization went to the Romans, and after the fall of Rome, these basic discoveries passed to later Europeans who expanded on the scientific knowledge, And in modern times, these ideas were developed by such Europeans as Volta, Ampere, Watts, Bell, Edison, and Einstein, who provided the basis for most of the technical wonders of today. All of them dreaded white males who thought that they could think objectively. Do you understand that the ancient Greek philosophers started it all? Do you understand that Archimedes, who perceived the center of gravity of solid cylinders and spheres, which is something that is taught in basic geometry from the time that geometry was first taught, is based upon objective reasoning. That is how he came to understand what the center of gravity of solids, cylinders, and spheres are. Do you understand that without that basic building block of thought, there is no logic, there is no science, there is no civilization? So this is the insanity that is now pervading. Then we went on 
And I spoke with the producer of the El Chapo documentary, David Broom, which I thought was fascinating, and it, it went, it really moved quick. I would have had him on another hour, but Netflix pulled him. They were fighting with my producer during the show. I'll tell you this straight up. Well, I'm not, I don't care who this kid was. The, the producer wanted to stay on the show, and some unknown nobody didn't permit him to stay on any longer. Would you believe this? What they're hiring today at these companies? Who are these people? So anyway, I want to talk about all these topics at once, all of them. The God book, why we're seeing the word God everywhere, the El Chapo documentary on Netflix, the um, white privilege lie. All of these topics are interesting to me. They're interesting to me. They're worth talking about. The last thing I'm going to talk about is Bob Corker. I'm not going to give you the latest inside gossip about the Hill or what little busy, buzzy, buzzy, buzzy thing went on in Congress. I don't care. How can you listen to that rubbish? The minutiae of government. Why is that of any interest to a general audience? When did the people get so distorted to think that the minutiae of government is of any interest to the general audience? I was never interested in that crap. What one politician did, the other one politician that, a fly landed on Bob Corker's nose, Donald Trump swatted it with an ice cream cone. Who cares? How could that become fodder for talk radio? How is it even possible? So I don't do that stuff. It never interested me. What interests me is what I'm talking about, the other stuff, the other things. So if you care to join in the conversations that I'm interested in, whether it's the fake lie of white privilege, the degradation of the universities by people who never belong there, who couldn't ever get in based upon their actual achievements, but forced their way in uh, through affirmative action and now trying to destroy the, the universities themselves because they can't keep up with logic or scientific method. Go ahead, make my day. But remember one thing, you can curse me and all white males if you wish, but that will change nothing. And if you call me a liar, you'll have to come up with the proof that I'm wrong. Did you hear what I just said? Go prove it. Now, here are some of the great callers that we have right now on the Savage Nation and some great sound as well. Uh, let's begin on WABC. Yvette, you want to talk about the documentary, most particularly about Kate Del Castillo, who uh, is the center of it. Go ahead, Yvette. You're on the radio. Yes, Michael. Let me tell you first. I'm from Tijuana. I grew up in Tijuana. I'm living in New York City right now. But I grew up in, uh, when I was growing up, we were hit with the cartel coming to Tijuana. So I know the drug situation uh, very well. Okay. Uh, Kate Del Castillo is a disgrace to the Mexican people. I'll tell you why. She, uh, this all started back like, I don't know, three years ago when she, it occurred to her to start defending El Chapo via Twitter. So now, put yourself in the shoes of a normal Mexican that has seen their country completely and utterly destroyed by the, by the narcos. So she comes out, she's very famous, and she became very famous as of late because somebody had the brilliant idea of making uh, a new genre. So far for us, but the storyline is about uh, drug dealers, about the couples. And the truth is those series are really good. They're really good. Wait, wait, so she, play, she played the role in that soap opera which glorifies the drug dealers? Yes, very much so. That's how she became. She's been famous. She's oh, famous. that's her background as a soap opera star. Yes. So she glorifies <laughs> the devastation that has been wrought upon your nation in plain English is what you're saying. That's how it came about. First of all, she's playing this couple on TV, which is a very, it's, I mean, it's good TV. But if you if you go a little further about like the, the narco cultura documentary that you were seeing, it's been penetrated into our society where kids are glorifying the narcos. So we don't want that. And she's very famous in Mexico. So when she comes out and starts defending El Chapo, it, it created a huge backlash. So anyway, this was like three years ago. And then it comes out that she, she went and she met El Chapo, right? We, we all saw the interview in Mexico. So what happened is that she got huge, she was hugely criticized. She became like a pariah number one in Mexico because why is she meeting El Chapo? If you look at the pictures from the, from the interview, from the, from the article in the, New York, in, the, in, the New York, in the New York Times, I believe it was, you can see that she's all cuddly with El Chapo. It's like she wasn't going there as a, as a journalist. She was going there because her mind was that she wanted to make a movie about El Chapo, so she was going to, you know, make a deal with this, with this, with this, with this, with this person. that. Has I, I mean, not to get into a Harvey Weinstein element, but I think that she intimated that there was a relationship between herself and somebody involved. I think it was Sean Penn. Oh, she said that she said that last week when she started promoting that. Well, that was that was disgraceful. I mean, that was embarrassing. I mean, why did she do that? She came out in Good Morning, Good Morning America and said she had 
she had had a relationship with uh, Sean Penn. That, but that was, but that was because she's a losing artist. I mean, she's she's going downhill fast. Is, is that of any interest <laughs> to think that that a soap opera star sleeps with an aging American actor? That's exciting. That's not exciting in and of itself. What is? And what is he trying to prove? Why does this guy Sean Penn think that he has to continue to play the tough guy at his age? I mean, what what is he trying to prove that he's still tough at his age? No, let me tell you what my position is. First of all, I'm a conservative. I hate Sean Penn. Okay, I think he's a disgrace. But this has nothing to do. There's a bigger talk. He's always been he's always been a dirt bag in my eyes. Ever since he did the uh, uh, Crazy Times at Ridgemont High, I never thought very much of him. But here that he's his father was a well known his father was a well known communist in Hollywood, and he came along thinking with a chip on his shoulder he had to be another one like the father with all of his wealth and all of his power he pretends he's a poor man down on the bottom working for the poor who is he fooling on Sunset Boulevard? No, the problem is not here. I mean, and with respect to us and Kate Castillo, the problem is not here. Sean Penn. Sean Penn was very stupid to go there. So was she. They were both extremely stupid. They were both arrogant. Well, let me ask you, wait a minute, you're just raising the most interesting point of the day. He claims, Sean Penn claims that his life is now threatened because he feels that the drug kingpin is going to feel that he, he led the, the Justice Department to the hideout. Do okay. you think, is that what, what did the Mexican people, what did the Mexican people say about this? Okay, uh, let me tell you why he's right. When the interview came out, they, the next day they captured El Chapo, right? Okay, so look at the timeline. They, this comes out, they captured El Chapo. And the Mexican government starts, he, they publish because Kate has been very critical of the government, right? So they don't like her. And you don't fool around with the Mexican government. They're a mafia, and also, they're also a mafia. So the, the Mexican government saw an opportunity to get her because she had been extremely critical of the, of the president, of mm. Peña Nieto. So the Mexican government publishes, publishes, they make public that they had tailed. They had tailed Kate they could see. They were following her Mexican intelligence. Wait, wait, say that again. They had ta they had ta Hold it. You said that the Mexican government released in Mexico the fact yes. that they were tailing her into the jungle? They were tailing her. No, not into the jungle. They had been they had been following her and surveilling her for months. So the Mexican government published the photos of her meeting his lawyers, the, fo the, the text message. Wow. Can you stay on the, on the line? Yvette, you know an awful lot more than you're saying. Uh, as an individual who knows Mexico inside and out, you're living in New York, I assume? Yes, I hear. I live here. I live here. Well, I'm honored to have you as a, as, a, as a listener and as a guest, but I want to know more about this documentary from the point of view of a Mexican person. Yvette, please don't leave us. And before we come back to Yvette, I have to tell you about, hey, you're talking about danger and protecting yourself. Let me tell you something. Getting traditional home security can be a punishing and expensive task. There is a better way to do it, and that's with Simply Safe Home Security. If you're locked into a long term security contract, you're really locked in. You're on the hook for three years. You're paying $45, $55 a month. Or go ask someone who's had a system hardwired in their walls. The installation alone cost them a bundle. But Simply Safe got rid of everything that makes home security a hassle. They make it easy for you. Simply Safe has no long term contract, there are no obligations. You can take it with you when you move because it's better, smarter home security. And your home is protected around the clock with 24-7 professional monitoring. If there's trouble, they'll send police. And this wonderful service from Simply Safe costs just $15 a month. That's three times less than what the other guys charge and no hidden fees. So protect your home today. You can buy Simply Safe at your local Best Buy and put it in tonight. Or visit simplysafesavage.com for a special 10% off. You heard me. That's simplysafesavage.com for 10% off your system. S I M P L I S A F E Savage dot com. This is the Savage Nation back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855 400 Savage. 855 400 7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800 289 2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Are there any Mexican people listening to this program who want to comment upon this whole issue that we are discussing? Because you know what? We Americans see it through our own eyes. They see it in having lived with it. Now, as I said, I had seen a documentary on the narco-terrorism in L.A. It was, in, it was in Spanish. 
with English subtitles. It was astounding. My, my, I was sitting there captivated. I didn't know anything about the music. I didn't know anything about the following amongst Mexican people here in America and the concerts that go on across the country. It's a whole subculture. Uh, I also saw the, the, the story through the eyes of little Mexican children who had lived in a thriving city in Mexico that had turned into a hellhole like Syria. That bomb, it looked like it was bombed out and burned out. A once thriving city with many stores closed because the stores had been uh, devastated by the violence and by the uh, um, extortion. Kate uh, Di Castillo did this this uh, story about uh, El Chapo, and we have a caller from New York named Yvette. Y- Yvette, welcome back to the program. Tell us a little bit more about your perspective and what she is uh, seen as in Mexico. K- uh, that is Miss Del Castillo. Well, Kate Del Castillo was very famous. She's very famous, and she's just she's like Harvey Weinstein. From one day to the next, it went down dramatically because she had no need to do this. She was very famous. She had made a lot of money. She was doing, you know, she was always having uh, uh, major roles in, 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 in on Mexican television. So she didn't have to do this, and she did this. I guess she was enamored. The fact that she, she started making these roles about narco telenovelas, she started, you know, that Chapo fell in love with her. It, it's very clear in the text messages that the Mexican government published. You can see the text messages. He tells her, she says things like, I'm so excited to meet you. He tells her, uh, I, wanna, I want you to meet my mother. I want to introduce you to my mother. He sends her flowers. She sends him, thank you. Uh, nobody has been so, has treated me like you. There's a text where she actually tells him, nobody has ever made me feel like you or nobody has ever treated me like you. So there was a relationship going on there. That's why in the pictures, in the article, you can see how comfortable she is with him. So then the question is to, for wait, us. Wait, wait. So if, if what you are saying is true, and I have no reason to doubt you, then it turns out she she has an affair with Sean Penn, according to all of the gossip. I mean, how is that going to impact her alleged um, romantic relationship with this very powerful man, El Chapo? I don't know, Michael. It's all very complicated. I think the Sean Penn is right to be to be to be scared. I mean, the lesson that Sean Penn has to has to learn is that he has to stop it, because he goes out and he meets all these terrible people, right? And he thinks, what is what is he thinking? I hope. Well, I think the problem with actors like him, and he's not alone, is they play immortal tough guys in the movies, and then when they go out on Sunset Boulevard or wherever they go with their bodyguards, they think that they're immortal, and no one can touch them. And they get used to doing Harvey Weinstein's, I don't mean sexually necessarily, a power trip on everyone around them. And there are no consequences for this power trip. But sometimes, as they say, the rubber meets the road, doesn't it? So that's what happened with Kate. That's exactly what happened to Kate, because here she is playing this narco, and she got a taste of the money, and she got a taste of the power, right? So she believed it. I don't know. It's crazy what she did. It's insane. She had no All right. In a nutshell, how does this end? For the average American listening, how does this end for everyone? How does it end for Kate? How does it end for Sean? How does it end for El Chapo? How does this end in your in your mind? For, for Kate, it has already ended because this ended her career. This this okay. Is- Number two for Sean. Do you want to say it or you want to leave it hanging? For Sean, I don't know what's going to happen to him. It's just a big life lesson. And for El Chapo, we don't know how he's going to act. We don't know how he's a, he's the craziest. Man. Well, you're a wonderful caller. Stay on the line. We're going to get your address. Send you God, faith, and reason because right now that's all I can hang on to. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Welcome back. Sorry for eating on the radio. But um, it's one of the signatures of my show. Since the show time is directly during my normal lunchtime for most of my life, uh, my nature has to prevail over my mind at some time. So I went up to the kitchen in the radio studio and grabbed some leftovers. (laughs) What you sacrifice to be in the radio business. Many of you think I sit and have these expensive power lunches. I'm eating out of a box from last night's dinner, (laughs) gagging on it. But the funny part of the story is I ran up to the kitchen to get the fish, the leftover, I don't know, halibut and some vegetables and a piece of potato. (laughs) I grabbed it, and my dog Teddy comes running up, and he's looking at me like, Dad, get 
your butt back down there, okay? He knows the timing of this show. And his little 12-pound dog is nudging me to get back to the microphone. He got me back just in time, I swear to God. These dogs are amazing. He sits through this whole show for so many years that he knows every break and every time. <laughs> and he doesn't let me miss a cue. I got to tell you that it's wonderful to have a wonderful mascot called Teddy. So, look, we could talk about this horror of the drug war and the drug cartels, and it's very easy to glorify criminals, which this society does through the media, which is why we love to hate the media. We watch the movies about criminals. Uh, Somehow we live through it, and then we go out of the movie theater or leave the TV room, and we live in the real world where this devastation occurs. It's very, very easy difficult to tell you that we must not glorify criminality at any time. On the other side of that line are the police, the detectives, who prevent this from spreading even further in the United States of America. People you may not even know interdicting drugs, stopping the poison from spreading. We already have an opioid crisis now. You know, Remember what I covered yesterday? Remember I covered the family, the Sackler family that controls OxyContin? Remember that story? I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but I said something in passing that should not be ignored today. I said, and you thought that the Crips and the Bloods were the most dangerous drug dealers in America. Remember I said that? You know that the major pharmaceutical companies are probably more dangerous than the cartels in terms of what they do to the society, in terms of their marketing, in terms of the poisoning of this country. This is not to say that all drugs are poison and that all medicines are not great, are are, are harmful. I didn't say that. But when you see a single family controlling OxyContin and the devastation that this drug OxyContin has, that continues to occur, you have to look beyond the criminal cartels. And then you ask yourself, they're on the boards of every museum in the world. So how different is it then? than the overt murderous drug dealers to those who own the pharmaceutical companies, for example, that peddle these dangerous drugs? These are questions that many of us who think are asking. And then you ask yourself, why does the government do nothing about it? When Donald Trump came to power, one of the things he said he would do was do everything he could to stop the opioid epidemic. Remember, he went up to New Hampshire where it's devastated one community after another. I haven't seen anything done of you. I see a lot of MS-13 gang members being rounded up. I don't see any people in white shirts and ties being taken out of glass of buildings in New Haven, Connecticut, for example. Say glass buildings. I'm using a metaphor, a a pharmaceutical company. So what do you do in a situation like this? You try to keep yourself away from it. You try to keep your kids away from it. You try to get your kids involved with sports. You try to tell them that Drugs are a road to hell and death. And would you be successful? Maybe. Who knows if you're lucky. Is there any single answer that, that gives you the answer? No, if I had it, I would put it in the bottle and sell it to you. I don't have an answer. I know that sports generally will keep a child away from drugs. Generally. That works. Not always. Sometimes doesn't. I get it. But you got to give children something, some other outlet. And you can't glorify that life. Ask the black guys who are reformed gangbangers who are in these communities around America trying to save the next generation from going down that road. Ask them what they have to do to keep the kids away from that very attractive life where the guy who's selling that poison has the big car and all the girls. What do you think a little boy 10 years old is going to think about them when he sees his father breaking his, if he still has a father at home or his mother, more likely, going to two jobs or three jobs? What is he going to think? In order to make his mommy happy, he's going to have to become like those those bad gangsters down the street. It's a very tough world that we're living in, particularly for those in those communities. You get it? KSFO, Chris, line one, go ahead, please. Yes. Hi, Dr. Savage. I'm calling because I'm very familiar with the uh, you know drug cartel wars in Tijuana. I personally lost two cousins of mine to the drug war about five years ago. And I watched the El Chapo documentary over the weekend with my wife, and one of the things we pulled from it was that this this uh, documentary was almost like Kate Del Castillo's, you know, mission against the Mexican government 
rather than just, you know, putting herself on a pedestal. I think it goes deeper than just her connecting, you know, with the cartel, you know, boss there, El Chapo. I think she's got it out for the Mexican government because uh, contrary to what your caller Yvette said about the text messages being released by the Mexican government, those text messages in the documentary, Kate says that the Mexican government actually altered her text messages and made it look like, the Mexican government made it look like she was having an affair with El Chapo. So they're trying to smear her and put her in a bad light because she had contact with him when the Mexican government did everything they could to try and capture this guy and they were getting nowhere. So that's what I think this is about. So you're saying, what are you actually saying is that she did not have it? Let's start with the basic sexual part. You're saying she did not have a romantic affair with him? I'm saying that the text messages that the Mexican government put out that they're claiming were hers were actually doctored. They were altered by the Mexican government to paint her as having an affair with El Chapo when in reality she did not. And that's in the documentary. Hmm. Why would that matter, though? Because I think the Mexican government has it out for her versus... You know, this this being more of a just El Chapo documentary, I think it, it 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 uncovers a level of corruption on a government scale more than just oh, you know, they're mad at me because I. So uh, so when I when I told the story of the Mexican documentary I had seen in Los Angeles in Spanish, on one side of the border is El Paso. Is the city on the other side Juarez? Um, I, I'm not looking at a map, but it's, okay. I, no, I thought maybe you know from that city. All right, Chris, I'm very glad that you listened to the program and have something to add to this. Okay, my friends, do you want to talk about The Crazy Professor? you want to talk about the documentary? Um, whatever. I mean, I have other topics I could go to. If you want, you really get me started, I can move to food if you'd like since I just finished this horrendous lunch. You know, one of these days when my radio career is behind me, I'll actually enjoy lunch again. I wonder what that's going to be like to go to a fancy restaurant and sit down with a white tablecloth and enjoy a glass of wine and a meal. You know what the answer is? I would hate it because I do it at night and I can't stand it. So why would I want to do it during the day? I don't understand why people look. You know, the movies glorify a lot of things, including they over glorify going to fancy white cloth restaurants. I hate those places. I can't sit in them. I prefer eating out of a box that I reheated, to be honest with you. I guess it's just my peasant background. I can't get over it. You know, I am an immigrant son, and I was thinking about this the other day. I, I want to move into this area for a minute. I was thinking about it, saying, why don't you live the way you really are right now, Michael? Why do you continue to live as though you just got off the boat in some ways? You're a man of some means. You have some fame. You have a claim. You're a best-selling author. I think to myself all the time, I say, why do you still work even? Why do you kill yourself on that radio show every day? It's certainly not for the money. So what are you doing it for? You know, and I ask that question to myself over and over and over again. And sometimes the answers come to me without my asking. For example, I took a friend of mine to dinner over the weekend. I will not mention his name. I respect his privacy. He was a captain uh, in, in Vietnam, paratrooper. To me, an American hero. He's one of my idols. And he still has injuries from the war. He never complains about the war. But he tells me stories about Vietnam and leadership and love for the country comes from a family of patriots. His father f was in the OSS, one of the or or original men in it. And he said to me, Michael, do you have any idea how many military people listen to your show religiously? I said, no, I wouldn't know. I said, I'm just in a room alone. He said, Michael, listen to me. He said, everyone I know on the East Coast, active, retired, special operators, they all listen to you. He said, they need you. I said, what do they need me for? He said, because you are their voice. Well, that becomes a huge responsibility to get up every day and remember that there are people who count on you. You understand what I'm saying? But it does get me out of bed. Some days I feel like staying in bed. Do you know that? It's not that I'm old and tired. I'm worn out from the political garbage that I'm listening to. I can't take another day of it. Do you really think that in 50 years we're going to look back and think that every breath that Donald Trump took or every breath that one of the dunces on television uttered is going to be remembered? I could care less about what he says and what they say on a daily basis. So say, well, if most of talk radio is about the utterances of the president or the utterances of the dunces, 
Why are you not doing that? Because it ceases to interest me. It never did. So what interests me is what interests me. So this documentary interested me. So I'm very happy that God delivered an idea for me today. See, this is what I'm trying to say to you. Like today, I said, I don't know what I'm going to talk about today. I actually dreaded it. You know, I never dreaded radio. I'm starting to dread getting up and doing the show. Do you know why? Because I can't do any more about politics every day. I hate it. I hate listening to it. I don't know how anyone does this day in and day out. God bless them if they could do it. Bob Corker said this. Bob Schmedrick said that. Chaim Putz said that. I can't listen to this garbage. This one said that. No, no Gingrich tooted that. This one tweeted this. This one belched that. This becomes the degradation of the human mind. Millions of years of evolution to produce us. Millions of years to produce you. Your mind. Your mind is a terrible thing to waste. And believe me, there's no greater waste for your mind than to talk about politics day and night. It can rot, rot a soul out of a man. It can rot the soul of a nation to get obsessed with what goes on with a bunch of gangsters in Washington. You're telling you're talking about criminals and gangsters? Hm. Don't get me started on the political uh, class and who they really are. They're gangsters without guts is who they are. They're on the take and they're on the make. You could buy them as cheap as you could buy. Well, okay, don't, don't let me go down that road. And believe me, I've always seen it this way. And it goes all the way back to my immigrant father, my little old immigrant father, holding my hand, walking in the streets of New York, and we talk about a lot of things. He never went past high school, but he knew a lot because he read a lot. And he didn't read books, he read newspapers. He read four or five newspapers a day. I said, I asked the dad, why are you reading five different newspapers in New York? The Daily News, the New York Post, the Journal American, the this one, the that one. I said, what do you read all these newspapers for? They're all the same, dad. He said, no. He said, they have different opinions about different about the same subject. So he said, I, listen, I read all of them and I come to my own decision. He taught me to reason. He taught me how to reason. He wouldn't answer a question. If I asked him a question, like how tall is that building, he would say, Let's try to figure it out. He taught me how to think about how tall it was. He said, if the average floor of a building is 10 feet and you're looking at a 10-story building, Michael, he said, how tall is the building? I said, 100 feet. He said, now you figured out how to answer your own question. So I had a, an immigrant father who never went to school who taught me how to think. Do you understand that? How to reason. And so we come now to this. Every day is unreasonable. Every day, politics is the most unreasonable sport in the world. There's almost no winners and no losers. It's all a blood sport, as it has been said. Okay, <clears throat> what do you want to talk about? 855-400-7282 is the phone number. MichaelSavage.com is the website. And I'm going to tell you something about health now for a minute, since you know I know a lot about it. I bet you don't think much about your circulation, right? Well, you should think about it. It's all we got. A good circulation is crucial to energy and stamina. It brings oxygen and nutrients flowing throughout your body and your brain so you can exercise longer, do more everyday activities, and frankly, think better. So what do I say you should do to promote healthy circulation? Simple drink, Super Beats. Yes, they are a sponsor, but it's a great product. Super Beats promotes the body's own natural ability to produce healthier circulation. It will give you increased energy and stamina all day long. And by the way, Super Beats is made from beets, that are grown to exacting standards. They're the only product like this. And then they concentrate this into superfood crystals. And if you want to try and improve your circulation, call 800-481-0504 or go to savagelovesbeats.com. With your first order, you're going to get another 30-day supply of Super Beats for free, plus indicator strips to see how Super Beats is working for you and your, uh, and, and your body and your mind. And you also get free shipping, so call 800-481-0504. 4810504 or go to savagelovesbeats.com today. Join the Savage Nation. Call now 855 400 Savage. 855 400 7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800 289 2646 or SwissAmerica.com. <laughs> It is in God's hands, that's all I can say, as everything seems to be. I know, I know, it makes no sense. 
I understand that. To rationalists, God doesn't exist. To rationalists, there cannot be reason and faith in the same breath. I understand all of that. But to me, the opposite is true. There's no way to explain certain things that happen. You can say, so it's chance. And, you know, I watch National Geographic, and I understand that the entire channel is given over to prove that there is no God, basically. <laughs> you know, yeah, I know dinosaurs really existed. I know they were not created by Walt Disney. Trust me, I understand that. And I do know what carbon dating is. I know how that works. I, uh, trust me about that. So how does a man who understands science and carbon dating and, and dinosaurs and history and the fact that a, a recent evolution, a discovery was recently uh, God, I don't have the time to do this. They discovered a tooth in Europe that's 10 million years old. Previously discovered specimens indicated that man had been on the planet, even in the proto form, for only 3 to 4 million years. So now they found a tooth from a human dating almost 9.7 million years according to carbon dating so it says all of our thoughts about evolution are all different now no we didn't all originate from africa necessarily as i told you when i grew up we thought civilization began in mesopotamia well that all changed in the 60s we had to change evolution itself to conform you see how that works Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. It is The Savage Nation. All right, so it's hour three, different hour, different tone, different tempo. Okay, so I went on Facebook and Twitter I had my assistant, Ryan, take a picture of me with the new book. And it said, first copy arrived, God, Faith, and Reason. Please pre-order for a faithless friend. And it's a picture of me in one of my home studios holding a copy of, of the book, wearing a Savage Nation hat. And behind me, and people always look deeply in pictures. They want to see every detail. They're looking for little, you know, like what's on the desk? What can I see? This. So I'm looking at the picture. I didn't even know this was in it. In the background of me, there's a picture of Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston that I keep on the wall as inspiration. That's number one. I didn't even notice it was in the studio till the picture. On the far wall, you see spears and a shield. That's actually a diac, a very, very rare set of diac instruments, which, you know, war, war uh, instruments that no longer exist. I bought it at an auction many years ago. Every, every father, every man of every family had a shield and spears and knives without which he wouldn't survive a day. So you think things are mean today and you think that people lived in harmony with nature uh, in years past, it means you're an ignoramus and you know nothing about civilization and it's discontents, that's all I can tell you. So what are people saying? Um, things like congratulations, another one says, you have some kind of personality, Doc. Many incredible minds are dry as toast. You are blessed. If you could make sure our mascot Teddy is in the frame, I'd buy the book. <laughs> ah, Teddy can't be in it. Then where can I buy the Savage Nation hat? I don't have any. I think we'll, we'll make some, okay, and sell them. I'm just reading what people are saying. How do I get a hat? Any mention of Zarathustra in it? Uh, maybe. Way to go, Dr. Savage. Can't wait to buy mine at Costco in Novato. Watching the liberals' faces when I have your books in my car. <laughs> you're, not, you're not allowed to buy your, a book now. You can't buy it yet. I shouldn't even do this. I know, till it's out. Best title ever. Good luck. Wait, there was something else that I wanted to read to you. Order the hat. Oh, you can't order the hat. I don't think we have any. I'm going to order one. God, yes. Anyway, people say different things. And I was thinking about the book. What does it really mean? Remember, I okay, I'm going to go back in it. I shouldn't, but I am. I can't help it. I know you'd rather talk about the drug cartels and the documentary that we covered. 
But already I moved on to a different sp- different space, so to speak. I remember when I had had a couple of bestsellers with this great publisher of mine. I said to them, look, I'm not doing any more political books. And then he came to me and they said, please do a book on Trump after he won. So I agreed to do Trump's war under one condition only, asked them. And I said, you're going to have to publish my book, my God book. At the time, it was going to be called God's War. So they said, okay, if you do Trump's war, we'll do God's war, your God book. This is important to you. But they asked me, why do you want to do a book book about God? It's not a political book. There's no politics in this book, by the way. It's actually a neutral book politically in, in in more ways than one. I said, because without God at certain junctures of my life, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be on the radio. I wouldn't be writing. I wouldn't have my health. I wouldn't have my family. I'd have nothing because I know I stumbled. I know I fell. I know I was on the way down. And I know that when I hit bottom, there he was, lifting me back up. I don't mean a magical hand came down from the sky in a robe and with a, with a rope. I don't mean that. I'm not Jimmy Carter. I don't imbibe strychnine and, and sit in the living room and see, you know, like my Lord walking around in slippers. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm telling you that at the bottom, all you have is faith. Now, I'm a man who's extremely reasonable. I was raised to think logically and reasonably and to reason with others and and to figure things out. But at a certain point, reason fails us. Do you understand that? At a certain point, our reason will fail us and we have to rely upon faith. So, I mean, it comes back in a circle to that first topic I covered today about the crazy math teacher who's saying that you, we can't study logic and scientific method, we can't study uh, geometry, we can't study uh, any of that because it's white privilege. And there's no such thing as objective knowledge, it's all subjective. She is taking her faith in liberalism to an extreme and saying that there is no reason, there is no logic, there is no science, it's all what you believe and what you feel. In other words, if it feels good, do it. So in other words, if she was building a bridge, she'd start on one side and she'd have tele engineers on the other side to start another way and just feel their way across the bay. And if the two sides didn't meet, if the cables were a mile apart, it wouldn't matter because they felt good building the bridge. And then like a stupid child, they'd walk away from the dangling cables in the water and say, well, we'll try again because at least we had a good time and we were doing what we wanted to do. That's what the schools have become today. That's what the universities have become. If it feels good, do it. You want to smear mud on the wall and call it art? Go ahead, smear mud on the wall and call it great art. You want to make up gibberish and call it poetry and give yourself an award? Go ahead and laugh at all of the great rhymes of the past. You know, call it poetry because it bashes white males in American civilization and make that into English Lit 101. Actually, make it into, into graduate science, graduate English. So that's where we're at today, and uh, it brings me back to the first topic of the day which is you, the audience, and the topics that I was talking about. The phone number is 855-407-282. James on KSFO is calling about the uh, crazy math professor. James, line five, go ahead, please. Hey, Dr. Travis, thanks for, uh, for taking my call. Honored to be on your show. Yes, uh, this genius, uh, she, um, first of all, you can't deny objective knowledge without affirming it. So she's taking a saw and cut off the very limb on which she sits when she says all knowledge is subjective or it can't be known. Because does she include her own statement in that all knowledge? So uh, <laughs> I got what you're saying. In other words, her definitive statement that there's white privilege and that uh, mathematics itself is racist is a statement that relies upon logic in her mind, correct? Ex- well, yeah, it gets even worse, though, because the statement doesn't meet its own standards. When she says all knowledge is subjective, well, is that? Or, or all <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. All right, so her statement is, uh, is subjective as well, so it has no, ba- no basis uh, in, in reality. Yeah. She's so, Jay, James, James, what, what, what did you study in college? What was your major? I was <laughs> – I never finished college, Dr. Savage, but I'm a great reader, so. <laughs> well, no wonder you can think. Well. Uh, that's, why, that's why you can still reason. Okay, my friend – Stay on the line for a copy of God, God, Faith, and Reason. When it comes out, you'll get one of the first copies. What's interesting is the people who get the free books get them faster than in the bookstore because I have the copies. What happens is they start mailing them now. Isn't that odd? <laughs> like they're calling saying, I read it, I love it, and it's not in the stores. I never knew how that worked. 
Now we're going to go into the horrible story of drugs and the drug cartels. Joe on KLIF, line six. Thanks for calling from Dallas, Texas. Joe, what is on your mind? It's my privilege to speak with you, Dr. Savage. You're the new Socrates of this generation. Well, I, I don't know about Socrates, but I appreciate your compliments. What, what's going on down there? Well, uh, I'm not in that area anymore, but I grew up in that area. I'm bicultural and bilingual. I worked there as a forensic counselor, meaning that I worked in uh, with the uh, criminal offenders, both in a, I supervised a locked psychiatric ward for MHMR, and I worked in halfway houses in El Paso with state and federal offenders that were dual diagnosed, meaning that they had an addiction and a mental illness. And my experience both uh, traveling to Juarez, which is the city across El Paso, which everyone should know, Dr. Savage, uh, there still exists killings of, uh, the count right now is of at least 3,000 killings on the Mexican side, maybe five minutes from, the, from El Paso, right on the border. 3,000 every year? Are you saying 3,000 every year? And what I saw in the documentary was that Juarez had been a thriving city with small businesses, and then the cartels moved in and extorted them, killed people, and took over the businesses, drove them out of business, and it became a ghost town. Has that changed? Has it become back, come back to life? No, that's not true at all. Uh, Juarez has always been a very busy, overcrowded, populated city. Juarez has the populations of the people from the rest of Mexico that come to the border, which are attempting to move and cross over illegally into the United States via that border. Mm. That area has always been overpopulated. That area gets all the people, the poor people from Mexico who have no hope, who have no jobs, no education, move in that area to work to try and come across the border. But I'm saying, are the murders still occurring in Juarez? Yes, they are. And the, mur the murders that are still occurring uh, are not just simply related to the cartel, which is the story that is put out there to try and uh, give everybody some sort of peace of mind. The truth is, is that those mm -hmm. murders are murders from any opportunistic criminal who wants to take advantage and say, oh, it's the cartels. Oh, so you're saying that documentary was throwing mud in our eyes by saying it was all the cartels when it could be government corruption itself or, let's say, other criminals. It not, it not only could be, Dr. Savage, it is. It huh. is both law enforcement, state, federal, municipal, and any cab driver who was a criminal who wants to get away with taking advantage of poor, uneducated individuals. Well, here's the question. I, you know, you know, as an immigrant son, I, I have two, two sides of the story of immigration. I see the poor Mexican people here. I speak to them almost on a daily basis on construction sites because I bicycle by. I've gotten to know people. One guy from Guatemala doesn't make me an expert, and he speaks you know, the native language, and we, we joke a lot about it. I see the hardest working people in the world, totally uneducated. They're illiterate in their own languages. Tell me something. How can this country take in all of the world's poor and downtrodden? How is that possible? You know, Dr. Savage, it's not possible. But these people, you know, there's two kinds of people like in every country, Dr. Savage. You have the poor farm workers from the interior that are good, innocent, caring individuals that are not criminals, that are really only out to make an honest living and be participants in the community. And then you have those from the presidential positions all the way down to the poor people who have grown up in a criminal society that has seen, smelled, learned nothing but living in a criminal society. So when in Rome... When, when you, when you, you were a counselor, a mental health counselor with criminals or drug dealers or both? Both. Material so witness. What, what would you, what would, what, what, so let me ask you something. As someone who's trying to delve into the mind, can you really alter, can you really alter the mind of a murderer? No, not at all. Maybe if, uh, maybe Dr. Savage, if my uh, hypnosis was a little bit better, I might get away with it for maybe a few months or something. But I think eventually the mind would go back to what 
whatever it's been grown up to do, and it's a survival situation. So it's kill or be killed. It's that simple, and they're never going to change, no matter what dressing, window dressing the liberals put on it. Exactly. And those people come over here, and you have a mixture of those people who are still thinking that way. They come here. They don't know any better. They're uneducated. I've dealt with their children both in parenting, counseling, and in psychotherapy with other therapists coming in to do the work. Now I'm in the Arlington, Dallas, Fort Worth area, which is still very prominent of a lot of migrant people here. People that don't have an education, people that, you know, now their children speak English well, just like you mentioned about it, typical immigrant families, their parents, they just, all they knew is work, all they know is work. You tell them, let's go have fun. Fun for them is throwing money at their kids because they don't know what fun really <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah, that's true. I'm still, I'm almost still, I'm pretty much still stuck in the immigrant mentality myself. I never was able to change it. And you know what? I just may as well accept the fact that that's the way it is. That's my worldview. So anyway, this has been very enlightening, Joe. I thank you for listening and calling from KLIF in Dallas. I've got to take a quick break, and I'll be back to take your calls on any topic you wish. We have a caller, Paul, who says he had lunch with an El Chapo lieutenant. I can't wait to hear him right here on The Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. But I'm going to read you one line from my book. I'm holding my fire till it's out. Preface, first line. I never saw God, nor do I pretend to have any special insights. What you will see in this book are snapshots of God, not a complete film. I'm going to leave it at that. And then sprinkled throughout this book are biblical quotes from the Old Testament set in a kind of antique type. So those of you who've walked away or really don't read the Bible are going to get a double out of this book. It's going to be as though you're reading the Old Testament next to this one man's odyssey thing. I want you to hear the first quote in God, Faith, and Reason. It's from Jeremiah 1.6 because I'm a... I just love Jeremiah. And so here's the quote I put as the first quote in this book. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For to whomsoever I shall send thee, thou shalt go. And whatsoever I shall command thee, thou shalt speak. And now you understand why I'm in talk radio. I didn't choose it, it chose me. All of, well, I, I gotta save these stories for when the book's out there. I, I gotta tell you, it's like, you know, okay, put it this way. Life cannot be understood going forward it could only be understood looking backward. I read that so many years ago. I don't know who wrote it. I was in one of the books by Aldous Huxley. I think it was written by, by Blake. I'm not sure. Life cannot be understood going forward. It can only be understood looking backward. And you have to have some time on earth to look backward. Children don't really understand where they sit or where they fit in time. They're happy-go-lucky. They're innocent. They just want to have a good time. That's the way it should be. Children are supposed to have a good time. They're supposed to have an innocent childhood. Unfortunately, some don't. Some are marred by poverty or tragedy or disease, and they have no childhood. We know that. But most of us are lucky, and we have a childhood to look back upon. But there comes a time that you put down your hat, and you put your hat that's on backwards, and you put it on forwards, and you stop looking at the fools who take a knee as heroes, and you look at the sharpshooters in the U.S. military who take a knee to kill the enemy. That's taking a knee. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. One of the stories that caught my eye was something I predicted might happen. A professor is now claiming that math, algebra, and geometry promote white privilege. 
I said, no, this is not made up. It can't be. The Daily Caller, Ian Mills Chung, wrote that a so-called University of Illinois math professor has said that algebra and geometry perpetuate white privilege because Greek terms give Caucasians unearned credit for the subject. She also believes that any evaluations, meaning tests for math proficiency, perpetuates discrimination against minority students if they do worse than their white counterparts. Now, how this moron, Rochelle Gutierrez, could ever become a math teacher in this day and age is not beyond me. This is what's happened to the universities. Here is a woman who teaches math. She put out a newly published math education book where she argues, again, that algebra, geometry, and math themselves prom promote white privilege. But it gets even worse. She argues that reason itself promotes white privilege. And the only way to understand anything is subjectively. She said that only subjective understanding can eliminate white privilege. This lunatic says that minorities have experienced microaggressions from participating in math classrooms where people are judged by whether they can reason abstractly, and I'm not, I have to quote, end the quote there. To resolve the intelligence gap, Gutierrez calls on math professors to develop a sense of political conocimiento, a Spanish term for political knowledge for teaching. This idiot concludes her argument with the claim that all knowledge is relational or relative. And listen to what this psychotic says. Things cannot be known objectively. They must be known subjectively. Let me explain something to you. If people like this had been teaching in the 1930s, you'd be speaking German or you'd be a lampshade. Let me say it again if you don't understand the drift of what I'm saying. If idiots like this had been teaching in America in the 1930s, and our children in the 1930s had not been taught to reason, to do mathematics, they wouldn't have been able to build a bridge, they wouldn't have been able to build a plane, a tank, they wouldn't have been able to reason, and we would have been defeated by Hitler, and you would be speaking German or you'd be a lampshade. I'll repeat it enough times for you to understand how dangerous this country has become as a result of the totalitarianism of the left or the tyranny of the minority. And affirmative action has destroyed reason itself. I warned you years ago that one day we may wake up and find out that the words white Christmas would be offensive. Remember years ago I did this show? I said white clouds would be the word white clouds would be offensive. I said that reason itself would be attacked as white privilege. This must end, and the only way to end this is to laugh these people out of the classroom. You must teach your children to laugh at these professors, to video these professors, to circulate the psychosis of these professors and the overt racism of these professors before this nation devolves into a psychic cesspool. Other than that, I have nothing to say on the matter. Where is this going to end? A so-called professor has now claimed that math, algebra, and geometry promote white privilege. And she goes even further, this, this person, and she says that um, all knowledge is relative, that things cannot be known objectively, they must be known subjectively, which means if it feels good, do it. Now, you understand that the entire basis of Western civilization is built upon objectivity and reason which is why the tribalists, the primitivists who cannot reason, are trying to destroy the pillars of civilization, which is thought itself. You understand that? Where does it end? I know where this ends, unless we stand up to them, which I do every day. White privilege is when you can reason. White privilege is when you can be objective in your knowledge. All of science is built on objectivity. The reason that there is so much controversy about the false claims of climate change is because they become subjective in their opinions rather than objective. An objective discussion of so-called climate change would show the other side of the coin, the other side of the argument, wouldn't it? That's how science operates. So if you let these psychos take over all of science, which they have already done with regard to climate science, eventually reason itself, which is now under attack, will disappear. 
which leads us back to my book, God, Faith, and Reason. You see, everything's going to lead me back to that. I, I saw this coming. I sensed that the world of, of the mind was devolving under the left. I felt that the radical leftists who could not hold an argument or win an argument when actually challenged would devolve to hatred, would resolve, revol- revolve to violence, and devolve ultimately to insanity. And that's what we're living through right now. So I wrote a book called God, Faith, and Reason, trying to show you out there that you can be faithful and reasonable at the same time. And listen to the third word in that title, God, Faith, and Reason. Reason is a form of thinking that was developed by the ancient Greeks. If you read Aristotle or you read Plato, you'll understand the basis for all. Reason was built upon Greek knowledge. And I studied once when I was very young. I don't know. It was at City College of New York, I believe. I went back to graduate school when I thought I was not thinking clearly. I remember very distinctly why I took this course in uh, reason and scientific method. And we actually translated Aristotle into mathematical formulae. And we had to use mathematics to read Plato. That's when, when the courses were actually taught as such. Today, I don't think they could teach science, logic and scientific method at City College in New York. It would have to be filled with some kind of hatred and screeds against society, Trump, and, uh, and the American way. But I studied logic and scientific method, and I learned that his mind was so great, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greeks mind, Greek minds were so great, the philosophers who gave us the base of Western civilization, that you could reduce their words to mathematical formulae and see how perfectly they were ordered. They lived and tried to create an orderly world. I remember when I was in high school, I read Plato's Republic, and I was so impressed by it, I kept my copy of the book. I remember the Modern Library edition. I wish I still had that edition. I put it somewhere. It would be great in my archives. It's marked all over the place like a Bible. But I named this show The Savage Nation when I first started in radio in 1994 based upon the name Plato's Republic. A program director who I've not kept in touch with said to me, what do you want to call your show? I said, I don't know. She said, well, what do you like to read the most? She said, you always talk about Plato's Republic. She said, why don't you call it The Savage Nation? I said, great, thank you. This is a show where logic reigns. Logic itself is now under attack by people who are illogical and insane. They cannot keep up. They're not equipped to keep up. They have no reason. They cannot do mathematics, and yet they're mathematics teachers. That would be like hiring a person who can't fly to be a jet pilot, which is what Obama did. He took a woman who never flew an airplane and made her the secretary of the Air Force. That would be like taking a woman who never steered a 40-foot boat in open seas and making her the secretary of the Navy. That's what Obama did. He destroyed Western civilization one brick at a time. And now you understand why Trump is attacked on a daily basis. You know why? Because he's trying to rebuild America brick by brick. As flawed as he is, as imperfect as he is, as brusque as he is, he's trying to put this nation back together again. And all of the Humpty Dumpties who broke it down don't want this nation to be built back together again. Immigration, spending corporations, military, regulation of individuals and the government, homosexuality, guns, God. All of these topics divide America, in case you don't know it. Uh, 98% of the media is liberal according to, what's the number? Five to one, rather. That's 81, six, about very high. 80% of people in the media are hardcore liberals. According to a man who ran uh, the uh, National Public Radio, He admits the liberal bias in the media is so strong that it's impossible to hear the other side. And he he reflects on the demagoguery from the left and the right. And he said the attacks wouldn't be so successful if our media, he mean the attacks on the media, would not be so successful if our media institutions had not failed us as greatly as they had. Another topic is should class action lawsuits be banned class action lawyers be tried under RICO, and all of the assets that they have uh, attached in the last 30 years be seized by the federal government, even if the assets that they've gotten 
have been given to their children or grandchildren or, or into blind trust? Should the money that class action lawyers have put away over these last 30 years of a free-for-all against the American people be seized by the federal government and dispersed into the tax base? These are some of the questions that we're talking about. There are many others, believe me. The secretive family making billions from the opioid crisis came out in Esquire magazine. They have a name. Sackler is the name. Uh, There's another couple of things I should mention that's important here. In polarized era, fewer Americans hold a mix of conservative and liberal views, says the Pew Research Center. In political values ranging from views of government and the social safety net, to opinions about immigrants, race, and homosexuality, Americans are less likely than in the past to hold a mix of conservative and liberal views, meaning there's a real ideological divide right now, more so than in a long time. And uh, this is becoming a big issue. There's another one I want to mention. Churches merge and close. We no longer live in Christendom. We really have to accept that that's a thing of the past. And so now churches are joining together because they're closing down. And it's the same with Reform synagogues. Two historic Reform Jewish synagogues, Temple Oheb, Shalom, and Park Heights, and Har Sinai Congregation, Owings Mills, have announced they will likely combine. There's a reason for that. And that is because the only groups that are expanding religiously are the Muslim groups, the Orthodox Jewish groups, and the fundamentalist Christian groups. The others, the, mid, the middle of the rotors in religion are disappearing. And so they ask, how much has your congregation grown? How many visitors have you had? Would you attend your church if you weren't a member? The world is changing. The world always changes. The world has always changed. It always will change. Nothing is going to remain the same. The only constant is change. Everybody knows that. And we're living in a rapidly changing world. And I feel that as a talk show host, being on the front lines of this change... I have an obligation and a duty to air, let people air their grievances, number one, and try to tamp down some of the hatred in plain English. Whether I have always lived up to that is another question, because I haven't. In the years past, I did not. But in the years of today, meaning my show of today is different than my shows of yesteryear in many ways, e- even though my politics have not changed. I want you to understand that. My politics of borders, language, and culture have been the same since 1994 when I began in radio. And I believe that the motto of the show, Borders, Language, and Culture, still is the most powerful motto you can have in talk radio. I don't know of anybody in the media who has a better motto. In fact, I think many Democrats would like to see firmer borders, a single language that defines America, and uh, let us say reliance upon our culture. What is our culture? People say, Savage, I I understand what borders are. I understand I'd like to see English as, as the only language that is permitted in government because we should not have a polyglot nation. It's a a divisive thing to let people vote in six languages. You know, in San Francisco, you can vote in over six to eight languages, and that was created by the Democrats in the state, in the city, in order to make sure the illegal aliens could keep people like Pelosi, Feinstein, and the time boxer, and the illegitimai in Sacramento in power. So that's why they allow the ballots in six or seven languages, which I think is outrageous. I'm an immigrant son, which I'll repeat over and over again. My grandfather had to learn English in order to vote, he could not vote in his native language. It would have, been, would have been unheard of. Who ever heard of a man coming to America, not speaking a word of the language and being, a, a, being able to vote? How could they even know what they're voting for? Well, now you know how a bumbler like Pelosi stays in office. They don't even know who she is. They've just been told to check D. And it's either extreme D or more extreme D or crazy D or cowboy hat D. Everything on the D scale. Nothing on the A scale, certainly nothing on the R scale. It's a one-party system. Be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. October 24th edition of the Savage Nation comes to a conclusion. What are the real headlines right now other than what I've been doing? The headlines. Where'd North Korea go? He got he got sane all of a sudden. 
Kim Jong mentally ill and took a sanity pill. He's still threatening to blow up Japan and the world. Nothing's been done. Another Republican has attacked Trump, saying, heaven help us. See, the, when you say Republican, they're not Republicans, they're Republicrats. How many years ago did I coin the phrase Democrat or Republicrat? Well, like in the beginning of my radio career in 1994, I said there's hardly any difference between most parties, between the two parties. Republicrat, Democrat, Democrat, Republicrat. So now you got two of them ripping Trump to shreds as they exit the door. Corker now, Flake. These are not conservative Republicans. Middle of the roaders, if you want to put it that way. It doesn't make them evil. But they're not the opposition party that we need to the liberal party, which is the Democrat party. Let me put it to you this way. There's something to remember. Every bird needs two wings to fly, a left wing and a right wing. For eight years, the right wing was strapped to the bird's body. Obama and his minions took the right wing of the bird and glued it to the bird's body. And the bird flew in circles because only the left wing was flapping. So Trump comes along and he's trying to unglue the right wing and let the bird fly with two wings in a direction that is best for America's borders, language, and culture. And what's happening? Those who helped Obama put the glue on the bird's right wing are becoming unglued. And that's a nice metaphor for the end of the show, is it not? Why do you think all of a sudden we're seeing the word God everywhere? Wahlberg saying he hopes God forgives him for playing a, pornograph a, a porn star. O'Reilly says he's angry at God for what happened to him. All of a sudden, God is in the wind because they know which way the wind blows. And it's whichever way the savage winds blow, that's the way the winds blow in the media. And on that pleasant note, I'll see you tomorrow with God's will and your listenership. Savage.